Uh, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine, and uh, we're, we're delighted to have with us this evening uh, Rabia Chaudhry, uh, who's here to talk about her new book, Fatty, Fatty, Boom, Boom, a memoir of food, fat, and family, and that's hard to say without smiling. Um, Robbie is an attorney, author, and, and podcast host, known, among other things, for her efforts to publicize the, the case of a f family friend, Adnan Syed, whose conviction, uh, which was just recently reversed, for the death of a high school uh, girlfriend, <clears throat> of course, became the subject of, uh, of the podcast uh, Serial in 2014. Uh, Rabia subsequently wrote a best-selling book, Adnan's Story, about the case and produced an HBO documentary based on the book. Uh, she's also done work through various organizations in such areas as countering violent extremism and promoting dialogue between Muslim communities and Jewish groups and, and law enforcement agencies. Her new book, though, uh, goes in a, in a different, a more personal direction, uh, though it still draws on her skills as a gifted uh, storyteller and cultural commentator. A fatty Fatty Boom Boom is a, is a very engaging, revealing, and instructive memoir about food and Rabia's relationship with food, body image, and, and family. Her own dietary excesses began when, as an infant, newly arrived in the United States from her native Pakistan, uh, she was fed half and half in her baby bottle and frozen sticks of but butter to teeth on. Uh, thus started a lifelong battle uh, with her weight. Uh, Rabia describes how she became addicted to calorie-rich junk food at an early age and moving from the half and half and, and, and butter sticks to cheap white bread and fast foods. Uh, she got chubby early and on top of her own self-loathing endured all so sorts of unkind comments about her body from family members and, and others. And yet now, having uh, gained control over her diet and her body, which she still doesn't love but no longer hates, um, she's able to look back and, and write with candor, humor, and insight about her experiences in a way that sh she hopes will be of help to many others. Indeed, Rabia dedicates her book to, quote, all those who have spent their lives being judged and judging themselves for their weight, who have struggled between deprivation and depravity, and who deserve, like anyone else, to live an abundant life full of great food. Uh, and, lest you, and lest you think this book is anti-food, it definitely isn't. In fact, the, the table of contents reads like a menu with chapters named for popular Pakistani dishes, and there's an appendix with a selection of enticing recipes. In conversation with Rabia will be uh, Yasmin Alhadi, an attorney who works on immigration issues at the Justice Department, uh, but she's also a stand-up comedian who's performed around the United States, including uh, here in D.C. at the Kennedy Center, as well as abroad in Britain. Uh, you also can find a number of her videos on social media. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rabia Chaudhry and Yasmin Alhadi. Thank you, Brad, and thank you to Politics and Prose for having us. Thank you, Rabia, for choosing me to talk to you about this fantastic, delicious book. I would have no other. This good evening, everybody, by the way. Thank yes, you for coming. Good evening. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you for writing mm -hmm. such a honest, raw, gut-wrenching, heart-expanding, waistline-expanding book um, about your life. And really, it feels like a love letter to yourself and to other people who may be struggling with the same kinds of issues. You've done a lot of public facing work. This is the first time that you've tackled body image or weight issues and I just want to know like why now? Why did you feel like this is the right time to write this book? Well, I mean, so when after a non-story was published almost immediately I was asked to like what's your next book going to be by the publisher and uh, lit agent and I said, "Well, this book nearly killed me. It required so much research. I wrote 800 pages. You have to fact check everything. So I was like, give me a little time. And then I was like, what can I write that I literally don't have to research a thing? 
<laughs> I just know it. <coughs> and that was this story because, like I said, you know, I'm, and you can write a memoir in so many ways, right? I could have written one about being an American and post 9 11 America, or being a Muslim in post 9 11 America, about being a woman in Muslim society, about civil rights. There's so many things. But all of those issues I have talked about publicly so many times, I've written about. Um, and this is one issue that I have never been able to. Um, speak about publicly, but I have n persistently and incessantly spoken about privately to all my friends. Anytime friends get together, it's what we want to eat, but also how do we lose weight? Yeah. Like that's the <laughs> always the conversation <laughs> my entire life. Yeah, well, that makes total sense. And um, thank you for opening up that part of your life to all of us, because I, you know, I'm not South Asian, um, but I am Muslim. And a lot of what you wrote here is, I think, maybe introducing readers to a South Asian reality. There's lots of history in here, incredible history about the partition. There's a lot here about the beauty of Pakistan um, as seen through your eyes, but also like the chaos and the difficulty um, and sometimes the, the, not, the not so pretty sides of the history. And I just want to commend you for weaving all of that together in, in such a beautiful way. You know, I... I it's not that this was the purpose of the book, but obviously there's no way to escape. Like, you know, Baca, p most people are familiar with India, Indian cuisine, Indian culture, Indian cinema. Um, Pakistan is related, but not. It's like that cousin who's ignored and not really paid, <laughs> but it's distinct. Its cuisine is distinct, its history is distinct, and I wanted to distinguish that. Um, but also, I really wanted to, because I read a lot of South Asian writers. Like, as a South Asian, you're always kind of gravitating towards that kind of writing and, uh, and those writers. And I always found it interesting because I would say, I, uh, sometimes the people in those books, they don't resonate with me because they're speaking in these really lofty philosophical terms, like these magic brown people um, <laughs> who just <laughs> have all these insights. And like my relatives just cuss like normal people. Yes. And you know, yeah. like just talk like normal people. They, yeah. They're not like, when the so stars and the moon align, my daughter, we're gonna be, you know I mean? There's yes. not like all this real lofty, Rose eso petal. esoteric talk <laughs> and magic in our spices. My mom's like, I hate cooking, but I gotta cook for you. Right. Um, so I wanted it to just be real, you know? And that authentic authenticity really shines through, to be honest with you. And um, you know, you you show your family cussing and you record it in this book, I which did. is great. I did it. She's like, I'm gonna with record an actual this. tape recorder. With an actual tape recorder, and it was like you're like sacrificing this Bollywood music that you really love, but this was worth it because you said you could blackmail them later, which I thought was delicious. Um, in and of itself, it was like a little nice nugget. You were like, I want to I want to remember this, but also I want to blackmail them. Yeah. Um, and. Honestly, I mean, uh, it's complicated. Like the relationship that you have with your family, it's complicated in this book. There's a lot of love, um, even within the family, like outside of you, you, you describe the love that the siblings have for each other. You also describe like a lot of, I, I think things that people that are outside of the South Asian community don't fully understand, like the relationship between Punjabis and like, you know, Karachi Pakistanis, like right? Speak, yeah, Urdu yeah, speaking. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's what you said is better. Like the Ur Urdu speaking versus Punjabi speaking Pakistanis or people that were on, you know, a different side of the border and like who was considered Mohajir and who wasn't. And in it, um, you you delve into the idea that people look down on other people. You, you have this great line in the book where you say they, th you know, Pakistanis thought that they had left behind the caste system in India, but the truth was that they just switched the players. Yeah, you know, that was totally true. I mean, my mom, it was funny, I would listen to my mom talk about how, you know, we're, we're, we're not like Hindus, we don't have castes, you know, we don't look down upon other people. But also, Pakistani Christians are only meant to be cleaners. Yeah. Right, it was like, th like there's no like self-awareness of what's actually happening. Yeah. And honestly, in every society, you have a caste system set up. I don't know if, it, I don't think it's any society that's free of it. Right. Um, but yeah, so my mom, my father's family is Punjabi, and my mom's family's Urdu speaking, and for those that it makes no sense to, um, when you read the book, you'll understand what that means and yes. why it means anything at all. Um, and I got to see the best and worst of both sides, and the stereotypes exist for a reason. There are kernels of nuggets, <laughs> uh, nuggets of uh, truth in all of it. So, Yeah, and you guys sh all should read the book and buy it immediately and have it signed by Rabia today. Um, <laughs> I, I got, a, I got the, an advanced copy, and I felt so lucky, and I could not put it down. I could not put down this Good. book. Good. I finished it in like five hours. Yeah, my husband was like, you're so smart. I'm like, I know. Um, 
don't have to tell me. I know myself. But the book I'm is... I'm a lawyer. Yeah, but like you could be smart and the book could suck and you could not read it. So the fact that I'm smart and read this book quickly is because it was so good. And and in it, you know, um, when I when, when you talked about like this like this Punjabi versus Urdu speaking kind of reality, and like you said, there's like nuggets of truth in it. And yet in it, you show like, hey, the people who feel like they're refined are sometimes the most sloppy and unrefined people because we're just humans. And, and what's so beautiful about this book, I think, is it shows all those shades of the humanity in each of them. And you really, you seem to be a little bit ambivalent or dismissive of your family's concerns about your weight in this book at different places. And then all of it changes. Yeah, I had like this weird, almost reverse body dysmorphia growing up. <laughs> like my whole family was like, you're heavy, you're never going to get married. And I was like, whatever, I'm fine. And I just, it didn't really bother me. Yeah. Or, and, I, and also, I was a real nerd. So my head was in all kinds of places. It was in books. It was in the famine in Ethiopia. It was like in all kinds of places, but that. Yeah. I wasn't too interested in boy. I mean, well, okay, that's not true. I was. But yeah. I just wasn't, I just wasn't. You had like concerned. a boy every week. I had. <laughs> I read well, the book. I read the book. I had a crush, crush. on a boy every week. Every that week. That sounds and terrible. Then, yeah, yeah, me. yeah, sorry, sorry. That you're a good Muslim awful. girl. You're not. You're not I would crush. You're not but me. I, You're better. Um, yeah. but, but I wasn't really concerned about like, you know, I just wasn't one of those girls who was like, I got to dress a certain way or look because like, I didn't have the skills, frankly, to do it. <laughs> but it really wasn't until I think college and I started realizing this is the age that like e either I get the marriage proposal yeah. or I'm in I'm screwed. Yeah. Right. Because that's like the big concern when you're a South Asian yeah. um, girl is like, are you going to get married or not? It doesn't matter whether you become the doctor or not, but are you going to get married or not? Right. And um, and then. Well, you have to have both. You gotta have both, you know right? That. You I know, know. I was a failure all around. And you know, you ever get prints? They send you to school and to go study, and then they're like, "Hey, did you s did you meet did anybody? Did you meet anybody? You're yeah. Like, in my internship? What do you, <laughs> what do you mean? Like, <laughs> my did you meet anybody? Building? But also, you're not allowed to date. Exactly. Don't touch them. Don't even smell, boys. Yes. You will get but pregnant. will they marry you? It's but are you marryable? Yeah. yeah. So, it, but yeah, really, it wasn't. I don't think the self-loathing yes. began until yes. my first marriage. Until your first marriage. That's because it became very personal. Well, here's the thing. My family said all kinds of things. My, my poor parents tried every kind of incentive possible. Um, they tried every kind of incentive possible to get this diamond for your boy. Here you go, baby. To get me to lose weight. And it never felt malicious. Yeah. It didn't feel hateful. I knew they were doing it at a pl place of love. In fact, when I started writing the proposal, it was very much like the spirit of this book is going to be and it, about my family is like my big fat Greek wedding. Like mm. th everybody has seen that movie. Yes. Right? We love that movie. Yes. That immigrant family loved the protagonist. They loved her, but they were like, you got to fix your hair. You're not going to get married. Yeah. I mean, and that was like how I felt. It never felt hurtful when my parents did. It really didn't. Yeah. It was. But when I got married, my, to, you know, my first marriage, um, then it was hurtful. Yes. It was malicious. Yes. It was it was meant to hurt me. And um, it's a very different delivery and it lands very differently. And those were the years that I really started to spiral. And it wasn't from a place of love. Oh, of course not. Yeah. And and um, you know, you were extremely honest in this book. I mean, about really deeply painful things like um, your abusive uh, first marriage and kind of dealing with a mother in law who was Stole my stuff, yes. She stole, stole my stuff. Stole your stuff and sucked her teeth. You have this line in there where she's like, she sucked her teeth and I knew, it was like she was like a hoover, <laughs> you know, that was like vacuuming your items that were uh, hidden away in your closet. And I don't think people uh, really understand that dynamic and like that it could happen in the United States. You know, um, so I, we, I grew, you grow, grew up watching like Bollywood yeah. and all these Bucks any drama serials in which like there's Sas Bahu means mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Literally every drama serial is around this dynamic. And yes. I was like, this is ridiculous. Including Choti Bahu, one of my favorites. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. And then you're in it. And then you're in it. And, then you're and in you're like, holy moly, this is literally, I'm stuck in a Pakistani drama serial. And um, like all, everything that my mom correctly actually predicted, yes. even though I rejected like, you know, all she was like, her. Punjabis are gonna do this to you. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I mean, I don't think it's because they're Punjabis. I think because it was just a cultural thing. Right. They were fresh. They were here, like had they had been here a year. Yes. And look, you know, I'm grown enough now to know that I'm sure my ex-mother-in-law was also treated very poorly when right. she was a daughter-in-law. Right. And this is the circle of life for South Asian women, yeah. right? Like, you just wait until you've got the power, and then yeah. you just, you know, you... you you pass on the, the pain. Well, I thought it was really big of you to thank her in the beginning of your book for some of your cooking. She acumen. taught me how to make rice, the best rice, yeah. There we go. And roti. Yeah, well, oh. okay, kind of, sort of. Sort of? She made me cry in the dough, but, that's you right. know. That's right. Yeah, well, that's what <laughs> makes it extra delicious, human tears. Um, 
<laughs> so you were you were extremely honest in this book, also about being really transparent about what you weighed at each stage of your life. Why did you choose to reveal to us what well, because, was on because it's all the scale? Because it's all relative, right? Like, so w one number might to somebody feel like you're way overweight, to another person might feel like it. So I wanted to be very precise, but also, you know, I have been that person who, I've ha I have three children, and every time I went into labor with each of my children, I was having labor pains and I was like, am I, you know, and all I could think about was the chart at the end of the bed mm -hmm. and I'm like, I just don't want my husband to pick it up and see how much I weigh. Mm -hmm. Like that's, who, and I, so even, like I've never even revealed to my husband, one or two, uh, <laughs> either one, <laughs> how much I weighed. But I realized that for this book, because I imagined the reader to be like someone like me who has spent her life um, as a woman struggling with these issues, and I wanted to be as precise as possible and honest. But the other reason I wanted to share it is because those numbers are seared in my brain. Yeah. There's a reason I remember how much I weighed at 10, at 13, at 18. Like These are like landmark moments in my life. Yeah. And so the fact that I remember those numbers is also significant. I would also like to say that there's this emotionally charged part of the book where you're in the bath and, you know, you know, and uh, should I say what happens or should I let them read it? No, I don't want to burn it. I should be like, let me just read the book, lady. <laughs> Stop reading directly from the book. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, there's, you should read it. It's really fantastic. It happens around page 200. But um, uh, th so there's a part there and, and w you know, we know a little bit about your weight number and I just want you to know that like, that had nothing to do with your weight. Do so you know that now? That I don't, we don't want to say what's going to happen, but yeah, you, like because you're sharing these these numbers. I right? still don't know if I believe that though. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I um, want you, you know, to. We are rooting for you in this book. <laughs> yes, we are rooting for you in this book. I, and, I'm rooting for young Rabia too. You know, as I was and writing now, it. Rabia. Yeah. No, but listen, I don't know a single person who has weight issues who has, who has not gingerly sat on a bench before and said, I'm going to break this. <laughs> I got to worry. And, and if it happens, you are 100% going to say, oh, I was just too fat for it. I mean, this yeah. This makes me sad. Okay, read the book. You'll see what I'm talking about. Then you'll want to give her a big hug. Um, okay, so y you were also very lighthearted, the book. The book is full of these, like, lighthearted anecdotes and, like, a lot of the school kids that were not so mean to you, but family that was more, I would say, directed in their comments, like you said, co probably coming from a place of love and giving you the name Fatty Fatty Boom Boom, oh, right, from one of your uncles, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, cousin, an cousin. older cousin called cousin. me Fatty Fatty Boom Boom, just Sorry. totally affectionately. Uh, yeah, like and that's what people have to understand. And you know, even my ex-mother-in-law, um, I remember I was, I was traveling to Pakistan, and I was going to meet their relatives in Pakistan for the first time. And she said, you know, a word of advice. She's like, back home, we called a bald person bald. So yes. when, a f when they call you fat, it's just because you're just fat. But yes. don't be offended by it. <laughs> yes. Because she's we're like, just... She's we like, just own it. It's an observation. Yeah. She's That's like, I'm just, she's I'm just giving you a heads uh -huh. up. It's going to happen. Um, I love that you also said that people like to stare uncomfortably. In, in, in Pakistan, In yeah. South Asian cultures. Yeah, this is true. I'm going to be honest with you. There's it's a lot like, uh, of staring. It's like they're betting their life on it. Yeah. You know, who's yeah, going to blink sizing first? Sizing you up. Don't look away. I, and I love... No personal space. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that they, um, like, you're, you have this scene in the... Can I... I am I allowed to keep talking about scenes in the book? <laughs> okay. Well, there's a scene in a book where uh, your future mother-in-law takes a look at your toes. Oh, yeah. And she notices something about your toes which is really funny, which was like one of your like insecurities, right? She noticed that she like picks up on the insecurity because the staring will do that. It'll like uncover the things you've been trying to hide. It was the first time I met her. Yes. And she sized me up and down like cattle she was about to purchase. Mm. There was no like looking away or kind of glancing, you know, so nobody noticed. It was like <laughs> up and down. Yes. And my, my second toe is longer than my big toe. And it's just been like that. I don't know. I probably got it from like two generations ago, some you know, uh, great grand ancestor who cursed me with it. But yeah. whatever. Um, and she said, um, she, what? she says you, it means you're going to be stubborn and try to control right. your husband. <laughs> right. She said, 
Th and this is literally the first time I'm meeting her. She's like, that short toe means, uh, yeah, you're going to control your husband or try to control your husband. Like that's, I'm like, oh, this is going great. Isn't this meeting is going really well. And then um, she's like, cool, hey, let's do it. We'll do it. Here's yeah, a ring. We're married. engaged. Let's you're engaged it. to my son, I yeah. guess. Yeah. A real fun moment. It's a tough one. Um, it's like, this is a joy supposed to be joyful. Um, but also it was like, you know, there, that was like a time in my life where I'm like, there's literally no part of me physically that can, that escapes scrutiny. Yes. Every part of me. I'm like, yes. do I hide my hands or my feet? Like what part is acceptable? Yes. Um, and every part I felt judged by. It was really stressful. And we feel that in the book that at different parts of your life, there, you're up for display. And you're on display. Even you know you, you become very famous with a non sayed story, and you feel like you're on display, and it makes you, a little bit uncomfortable. In many ways, when your family is like lightheartedly, um, speaking to you, or and the way that you're presenting in the book, you don't hold a grudge. You don't hold any grudges. No. No. I mean, look. Here's the thing. I know my parents and my uncles and everybody who was concerned. They know their people. They know our culture and our society, and they yeah. knew that like all of this is going to lead to her either getting marriage proposals or not and sh they were like she's really cute when she's chubby and little but at some point it's gonna be a problem right. and this is going to hurt her life and it's right. going to hurt her because people are going to be mean to her right so they were really doing it to try to protect me long term and you also speak very candidly here about colorism and oh, yeah. and specifically you talk about the fact that they're <laughs> your mother-in-law because she's the ex one is so delightful um she's like she's like a sure you're right but dark and fat yeah that was like a that was a really interesting compliment because I was like, oh, th she's like, you look like a Shoria Rai. And I was like, thank you. And then before I could finish, she's like, but dar dark and fat. And I'm like, okay. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like constantly it's like having a donut and then having someone smash the jelly out of your donut <laughs> each time. And then, I, and then you have these great comments with your mom. Uh, so I have an Egyptian mother who's the most judgmental human being on planet Earth. Um, it's, 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 I'm taking bets. Right? Yeah. I don't know. And then you've got your mom who rivals my mother. Um, and has all these nice, nice quips in here. You could tell there's a lot of love, but extreme judgment. Um, I want to know, did, what did she think about her depiction in this book? Okay, so my mother, when we got the advanced copies like six, seven months ago, um, she took the book. She read like the first, I think, five or eight pages and put it down and said, first of all, nobody's going to read this. <laughs> I love her. Oh, savage. So savage. And... Yes. And she's like, also, you didn't properly interview me for this book. Oh. And since that time, she has referred to the book, I swear, as that book you wrote about me. Oh That's the only God. way, the I only, can't. because in the first, in the first oh, chapter, can't. it's about her and it's my father her. meeting and getting married. Yes. So all she knows are those first five pages where it's about her and my father. And so it's, it's the book I wrote about her. But in many ways, it is a book about right, her. It is a book yeah. about her. Yeah. It is a book about her. Let's give it up for Rabia's mom and that judgmental Ami. tone. Yay, Ami. Ami, we love you. Also, give your daughter a break and be proud of her. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I, okay, so you decide to share some recipes in this book, which is so cool uh, for someone like me who's just boring Arab um, and who does not know how to cook all the fun things that you describe here, including how to make ghee, um, how to uh, make delicious rotis and paratas. Um, why include the recipes? And th it's an ode a little bit to your mom, but to all the women in your life, like I said before, what's so beautiful is that you thank all the women who've Including my sister who's right here. Is that her? That's my sister. Is this my Lily? Sister. This is Lily. Hello, Say Sandra. Hi, Lily. Hi. You're in Salam the book. <laughs> she really does look like a Barbie. You I said know. that in the book. <laughs> hey. This is what I was up against, my little sister. Yeah. Oh my God. And, and by the way, you guys, there's a scene in the book about Lily that kept me like frozen to the book. It's her. You're the reason that I, I couldn't put the book down. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. When you were just a, when you were just a wee babe in Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when I, um, when I wrote the proposal, what yeah. I realized was, okay, the main, the, you know, obviously the main thread of the book is about like my weight loss journey, my yes. weight loss story. It's not a prescriptive book. It's not a how to lose weight book. It's just like, this is what I've gone through in my life as it relates to weight. I was like, I can't divorce it from from all the food stories because it wasn't, you know, and I didn't really realize this until I wrote the book um, that my parents, even though they were always encouraging me to like lose weight, they were never depriving me. Right. They never, you know, they never said like, you can't eat that. We're controlling what you're eating. We're controlling your portions. I don't know if they even made a direct connection between 
what I what I was eating and weight because I don't think they were raised like that. When they were raised, they just ate their meals in Pakistan and they were fine, you know. I d and they certainly did not understand that food here is not the same as food back home because back home, you are literally going next door to the butcher and the whatever's available fresh that day, bringing it home and cooking it versus processed, processed foods with <laughs> full preservatives that we that they embraced very quickly. We ate so much gwaltney chicken bologna. Yeah. I cannot tell you. Um, you know, I just love pulling that rubber <laughs> off the sides, <laughs> rolling in it some Wonder Bread terrible for you right yeah. but they didn't know that that was terrible for me yeah. and so they loved me so much they were deprived me i mean i learned my abcs with like a for arby's b for big boys yeah. i mean so this is my mar parents you know discovering america but i couldn't put the food in there and all my my um you know and the truth is this i if i tweet a cup of jai i get like 100 requests for a recipe so there's oh. no way well that's why okay. yeah i could do this but you know i did have a tussle with my editor who is not a foodie and doesn't cook and she's yes. like you don't need the recipes. I said, I absolutely need the yeah. recipes. They have to be there. I can't talk about all these foods yes. and then just like leave people high and dry. And uh, on the, at the book launch on Tuesday in, in New York, she came to me at the end of the night and she hugged me and said, you're right about the recipes. <laughs> I love it. I'm sorry. It really <laughs> completes the book. Well, why I love the recipes is that um, in so many parts of the book, you describe in beautiful detail, which I savor every single second of like, how it tastes, how the food tastes, what it com what it's comprised of, the different um, flavor profiles that are in your mouth, and how it made you feel, and the people that you ate it with, and how that makes you feel even better about it. Like you talk about chai, for example, and I know some of the advanced copies came with like a chai packet for people, which I thought was so brilliant, and that really it's this love story between you and your husband, and he's like, you have to do chai the right way, and he's the one who kind of slows you down to be like... It takes him two hours to make chai. Yes. This guy right here. I was like, I got it's three fantastic. minutes in a microwave. Um, but his chai is legendary. Yeah, yeah. and like, Irfan's like looking at you in the microwave, and he's like, no, nah, girl. Don't mess this up. It's <laughs> blasphemy. You know, and, and, it, and it's just a, it's like a lovely way to connect both of your love for food. And sometimes you speak, you know, very candidly about how you use food as a crutch in many ways in part, different parts of your life to feel okay. And that you found that you could fully be yourself when you could fully indulge in everything. And then you come out of that, you know, you come out of that, that cycle. And, and it feels like the book is full of revelations. I want to know, like in the process, did you have any of these revelatory moments where you're like, oh, you know, this is what I was using food for. Like you talk about your mom in the middle of the night and what that meant, right? Yeah. Like, I, I kind of wanted to ask you about that. In the process of writing this book, did you feel like you had big revelations? You know, I don't, I'm not a, I don't journal. You know, I write a lot, but I don't journal personally. And this almost was like, like journaling, you know, in retrospect. And uh, one of the, inter you know, you're going to meet Ami in this book, and Ami is a formidable human being. But our entire lives, she would never sit and eat with us. And um, in, and my father, all he he's a big teddy bear, all he ever wanted was, please just sit, can we eat as a family? She wouldn't do it. She would cook the food, leave the food, but not eat with us. And we always took it as this personal affront. And it wasn't until I was writing the book, and I realized um, about, I, I realized at the time in my life, um, when I was at my lowest, when I, when I started eating in secret so nobody could see me, why I was doing it, what yes. was happening around me, and like, that this was not, it was not about not wanting to eat with people. It was about, there was shame around it sure. and judgment, um, self-judgment. -ju and I realized there's a story behind my mother's not, to this day, she's like in her 70s, she won't eat with us. So literally when she's like spending, when she stays over, we just leave food out because we know in the morning it'll be gone. Amazing. But she won't, and I, and I actually, f I used to be angry at her about it and now I feel a lot of just empathy and I just wonder what the story is there. So that was a big revelation. But another one was this, and that is that so much of it was not my fault. I was able to connect the dots between yes. why I was at my heaviest, my sickest, and what was happening in my life around me that yes. helped make me that way. Yes. And, um, and you know, the opposite end of that spectrum. It's, it's, it's so beautiful for that reason. It feels like a, a revelation. It feels like there are, are parts of it that you are discovering maybe for the first time. And um, what I, what I um, really love about this book is that you do squarely talk about the fact that some people will read this and think that you know, you're fat shaming them or that you're looking down on, on people who are overweight because you lost weight, right? And, and you talk. Some, I lost some. You look great. Yeah. <laughs> you look beautiful, can we? Yes. You look amazing. 
And um, some people are going to take this book as antibody positivity. What would you say to that? Yeah, and that was a concern actually that my that my editor brought up to me um, when I started writing the book. She's like, you know, what if you get this? And, and I I've been following the body, body positivity movement um, with just fascination and actually um, just a lot of admiration too. Yes. Because I'm like, if you are at the point where no matter what your size or whatever, um, that you just actually love your body, that is like nirvana. Yes. Like you have reached the promised land. Most people I know, I don't care what size they are, my friends, they're not, they might not hate their body, but they don't love their body, right? Yes. So, so being actually positive about it, I don't know if I'll ever get there, right? But um, for me, I, what I realize is this, I, and when you're in the public eye, you get criticized for a lot of things. Yes. You'll get, if I spend my time responding to all of that, like you want to shame me for being overweight, but you also want to shame me for going to the gym right. and eating healthy. Like which way do you, so I decided I don't care. It doesn't matter. All the only thing that matters really is like how I feel in my body and my relationship to it. And I can't respond uh, to that because it's like, I especially, I feel like women get judged no matter what they do. And it's I don't so want to be, yeah, I don't want to be shamed for wanting to feel better about myself, for not wanting my knees to hurt, for wanting to be able to touch my toes, you know? Right. right. And, it, and like you said in the book, you say it's, it's like a low hanging fruit to go after a woman's, a woman's looks. physical appearance. And, and do you feel that that standard is a complete double standard when it comes to a male in the public figure? In you the know, public eye, excuse me. I think about all those sitcoms that I watched for years where, like, the husband is, like, 340 pounds and the wife is, like, this tiny little... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we've seen this over and over again. That's a message being sent to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th and that message my uncle gave me, and, yes. and, and, you know, it's in the book, that it doesn't matter what a guy looks like. It doesn't matter how heavy a guy is, but for a woman, that's what's most important. More important than her intelligence, her kindness, her ambition, her achievements. Um, it is 100% a double, triple stand. I mean, we know this through how our first lady, Michelle Obama, has been treated. We know yes. this in so many ways. We see it over and over and over again. I have never heard commentary about um, the, pu the, the appearance of public figures, uh, unless they're uh, women, usually. Yeah. I, I never hear it. Isn't that amazing? And I, I, um, I love that you address that squarely in the book, especially as somebody who, you know, you had lost some weight and then you were watching yourself. You talk about watching kind of the documentary, that, uh, the HBO documentary that was about Anand Sayed's story and how it was like reliving a certain kind of trauma to see yourself in a, in a different stage of your life. Well, look, I mean, Serial, when Serial happened, like the, it was so much stress that in the time Serial it was like 10 episodes, 12 episodes, I gained like 25 pounds in that period. I was so stressed and I was eating nonstop and blogging nonstop and doing media nonstop. And I was like, this is the worst I have looked and felt in my life and everybody wants my damn picture. Yes. Like that's what it felt like. And everybody yes. wants to tag me. Yes. And they want me to retweet it. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not like, retweeting no. it. I'm yeah. not doing it. Yeah. But at the same time, I was I uh, was being tagged in terrible memes about me, about like how I looked and my weight and stuff. Sons and so it was Sorry. torturous. Um, it was torturous. <laughs> and so, you know, but it's like that's the thing. When you're in the public eye, you have to like put all that stuff aside and keep taking the next foot. When the documentary team was with me, you know. Uh, having seeing how the sausage is made, it's like it's different. It's not how you think a documentary is made. They don't just naturally follow you everywhere. They're like, Robbie, could you adjust your scarf again and stare out the window, like Longly. you know? Yeah, just like you know. Can you look can you, sad? Can you look sad? Just like yeah. your soul is breaking. Just walk down the hallway really normally for the fourth <laughs> time, and I'm like, oh, I can't <laughs> walk. <laughs> and the whole time, all I, I forgot how to walk. Exactly. Right. All I want is not to be on camera, and all I'm thinking is. We have to make this to help Adnan get out. And he's out, guys. He's out. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. He's out, out. He's out. Because the state did not refile charges against him. Well, they dropped charges against Boom. him. Boom. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Be quiet, you see. Yeah. <laughs> women are supposed to support women, not attack them. Be quiet. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to um, commend you on just like the level of honesty that that it just felt like a breath of fresh air to hear that from a woman in the public space and in the public eye and who is a public figure who has experienced so much success. And yet you spoke about this personal dilemma that you were oh, in. Feeling like a constant failure. Yeah. Feeling like a constant failure. And it just was like, man, 
it was like I can achieve all these things. But why can't I? Why can't my body? Why doesn't my body listen to me and yes. respond to me? Why does it hate me so much? Um, and yeah, so it was. That's always been. And it was. On, and you know, it wasn't until. I was past that point that I, I was like, I was able to write this book. I couldn't write this book if I was still in that place. Got it. But a few years ago when I finally was like, I figured you out. You're not so bad. We're yeah. friends now. I yeah. understand you, body. Um, that I was able to write this book. And what's so cool is that when you do reach that stage, you, you know, of, of gratitude for all that your body has given to you and um, you realize that the, your relationship with food changes and, and you say that, you know, you, you italicize this part in the book where you were like, I didn't know why I was eating. I wasn't even hungry. But it was like an insatiable hunger. Yeah, I would eat um, without being hungry, but with, without ever getting full. And I don't know if people understand what that means, like what that feels like yes. to not know what it feels like to be full. I was yes. like, something is wrong with me. All my friends, my siblings, my family, they're done. They would push the plate away. And I'm like, I'm not full. I'm not hungry, but I'm not full. Right. And I was feeding something completely different than like right. a physical hunger. Right. Um, so yeah, look, here's the thing. I wrote this book for somebody like me, like a reader like me. And I realized, and there were moments, there, there are parts of the book that close family and friends said, don't put that in there. You're really putting yourself out there. Yes. You're spilling all. And I said, it would be a lie to yeah. that reader, yes. to that woman who's struggling and has struggled if I didn't share this really important aspect, this one thing I did or tried. So the, uh, when it comes to like the weight loss stuff, I didn't, I, I put it all in. And I'm like, you know, um, and I realized that the reason we don't want to share certain things is always, it's always shame related, right? But the only way to destroy that is just to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk later, Yasmin. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I feel that so deeply. Um, and I also wanted to say, you know, um, one of the major revelations in the book that I did not know about you because I'm, I live under a rock in many ways, I did not know that you had weight loss surgery. And you, No, no, you're not under a rock. I never okay. shared that before. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I mean, cool. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing it in the book. Uh, you talk about getting a gastric sleeve um, surgery and then the timing is so incredible that you you write like this God's timing that tests you beyond your limits almost at this time where you make this really big decision to try to take control as you say of your life why did you feel like it was important to reveal that in this book I mean for for the reason that I just explained that like I that was such a an important kind of turning point and decision making point for me and um, I realized that if I didn't talk about it the reason I wouldn't talk about it is the reason I wouldn't I haven't talked about it in all these years is because yes. I did feel like there's you should be ashamed for doing that and when I had decided to do it um, and you know my husband we we've been together like 17 years now Irfan and I and we actually bonded over both of us trying to lose weight um, it's really and cute in the book. No yeah. matter where I've, I've yeah. been throughout our marriage, uh, what weight I've been at, he's always been like, you're perfect, you're beautiful, you don't need to do anything. But what I realized was I had been fighting, and you know, it's a Sisyphean battle. Like, you lose 10, S yeah, you gain 15. You, you lose sure. 30, you gain 50. We, anybody who's been there knows it. It comes back with friends every time because we are lied to uh, about so much of this stuff. We're lied to when it's like, oh, it's just calories in and calories out. I mean, like, we're lied to about so many things. And I felt so, it's like, I have tried everything. I have tried everything. And I'm reading the, d I'm reading the, um, the studies that say that like 92% of people who lose weight are going to gain it back. I'm like, you know what? And then I remembered like how every, almost every time I would have a baby, I would be advised by people, especially Muslims, don't have the um, epidural. If you feel all the labor pains, God's going to listen to all your prayers. I'm like, that makes absolutely no sense to yeah. me. <laughs> God made the epidural so I didn't have to deal with this. And I was like, you know what? This is something that can like be true. And I was like, I'm gonna, so, so for me, it was a decision. I, I was finally taking control. Yeah. I was like, I need to do this to take control. And anybody who thinks it's an easy way out has no idea what they're in for. That's right. It was a hell of a ride. And it was, um, I probably vomited a hundred times that first six months. It was really emotionally hard. It was physically hard. And I literally just hit, I lost 30 pounds. And at 43, I got pregnant. 
Yeah. I was like, holy crap. Timing. That was the end of that weight loss journey. Um, and yeah, and that's the little guy here who's been running around yeah, now. Yeah, Mr. Yassine, who yeah. looks like your twin. He does. A tiny, I love him tiny so guy. much. He's I'm best. so happy he came along. Yeah, and so, you know, I mean, I, I really wanted to share that because I wanted people to understand um, how it works and how it doesn't work, what it's effective for. But I will say this about this. It, m and I know, I, at the time, I knew six or seven other people who were getting it as well. So I felt some moral support in this yeah. community. Almost every single person, except one, every single person I knew lost a significant amount of weight, but gained almost all of it back yeah. over time, yeah. uh, except for one woman. And, um, and so it's not a permanent solution, yeah. but after getting this leave, it's the, it's, I, I finally know what it feels like to be full. And that is actually a gift it is. to know. It's like, oh, my body's talking to me and yes. saying, you're good. Yes. And so I, f just for that reason alone, I'm really grateful that I got it. I'm so happy um, and that, you, that you spoke about that. And you do talk about the regret that's, you know, that's associated with that, but also the gratitude, um, like you said. And I would like to say that um, I had my children naturally without an epidural. And I'm a real mom. You uh, that's all I want to. <laughs> Thank you. I feel great yeah, about that. I just that. wanted yeah. you to know. Um, you did it at home, right? In a bathtub? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. Uh, water broke in the elevator. <laughs> Very close. Very close. It was a close one. No, um, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I couldn't have an epidural. Take all the drugs. I know. If you, can, if you can have an epidural, take the epidural. Take I, just, all the I drugs. couldn't have one. Um, we are going to open the floor for questions uh, for the next 20 minutes, and we would oh love uh, to, to have folks come up right here uh, to speak to you. A local and celebrity. I'm going to wait until like the dam breaks. That first person National is always the dam breaking. And I just want to say this. I know I look like a Pakistani truck exploded tonight, <laughs> but there's an explanation for why I'm wearing this. Um, You're gorgeous? Well, I mean, the, the outfit's it's stunning. gorgeous. But no, here's the thing. So when the book cover was revealed yes. uh, like back in May or June, um, a little uh, boutique in India called the House of Sarabi contacted me and said, we would love to make something custom to match your book cover for the book tour. And Come so on. Hot Take pink photos and right now. Take the photos. It's hot pink and yellow. Killing it. And they took killing my measurements. It. And it was like, and I'm like, so thank you, House of Sarabi. So it was very sweet. And I, I wanted to honor them and their gift by, by definitely wearing it tonight. I was like, it's politics and prose. I'll fit right in. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, do we have anyone from the audience that would like There's to ask a question? There's a mic on this yes. side. Or you can just raise your hand. We'll call on you. Yeah. Or I can ask more questions. Well, thank you. It's been great tonight. Yeah, You're I know. I know. Sorry. Oh, Alex Cronomer. Yes. From UPF. Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes. United. Thank you for coming, Alex. Question. Question. Thank you. It's been quite a year. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it doesn't get mentioned often. I, I, I love doing it. Yeah, I can repeat the question. So Alex said that his daughter, who's with him tonight, um, is uh, a real advocate of the body positivity movement. And you know, listen, I have to say, it's, there's nothing like being at a time and place um, where you see representation of every body type and skin tone, skin color, um, and ethnicity, and beauty, and fashion. I mean, it's incredible. It's remarkable. And I know um, younger people are much more sensitive to these issues. But the thing is that, you know, I'm a progressive, but even in really progressive spaces, you can there can be some toxicity. And so I think like you have to be really careful to say to somebody that if you can't be positive about your body, something's wrong with you. And that's I, when the pendulum swings that far, you know, that's a problem for me. And I'm gonna uh, look. I'm gonna. I'm, some people might not like this, but the truth is this: um, that there, there are weight-related diseases. It's as simple as that. You know, I have friends who. They lost 30 pounds. They got off of their diabetes medication. Like, their lives changed. This is just science and fact. And so for me, especially at this age, I'm 48 years old. N I'm not, yeah, I want to look nice. But more importantly, I want m joint flexibility. I want, you know, body strength. I mean, listen, everybody get therapy and strength training. That's like the takeaway. <laughs> <from laughs> there's that. a takeaway from this book. Therapy um, and stretch bands. And stretch bands, yeah. Good. And so, heavy. you know, I say that it's great to be positive about your body, but you also have to be realistic about it. You know, we should enjoy food, but we should not let, we should not harm ourselves with it. That's how I feel. That's beautiful. Yes, in the front. Hi.
contained Isaac Thomas. That was not the whole paper. How did you distinguish between them? Like, what was the takeaway? Because when some, like, somebody outside the class agent was reading to you, and he is, like, you, like you, I totally agree with you. Like, when Sammy was saying, it's definitely from the same class, right? Like yeah, my family never said, you're disgusting. We're, we're gonna oh, re- I'm going to repeat this. Yeah, okay. repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I can so do I'm it. sorry, did you finish the question? Yeah. Okay. So the question is that how did I distinguish, like, you know, that when my family was advising me to lose weight or trying to get me to lose weight, that it came from a place of love versus when my ex-in-laws did. And believe me, if you've had those ex-in-laws, you would know. Um, So, you know, I mean, because my family never said, they said you're worth it. They said, you know, if you, we know what, how society is going to judge you. Whereas my in-law said, you are worthless. And um, I I think I wrote about this in my book that my ex was like, where are you going to go? Like, he yeah. was abusive. He no one abusive. will love you. No one will accept you. No one will pay 10 bucks for you. No one, but yeah, that too. So you tell me. It one. doesn't take a whole lot. That's the worst one. Yeah, it doesn't take a whole lot to be able to distinguish those. And honestly, like, we can always feel it. We can feel it when somebody says, oh, you know, when somebody even says congratulations to, uh, on an achievement, when it's from a place of sincer- sincerity versus a place of, like, a little bit of, like, you know, jealousy. Where, like, we can sense this, right? So, I mean, no, I never felt... Like my family hated me. I always felt like a, l- a lot of love. Yeah. Yes, Alex, once again. So, so with, with your journey, of the struggle you had to get into the marriage thing, is that when it began? Oh, certainly not. I mean, I weighed, apparently, according to the family lore, 50 pounds at uh, two years of age. So so the question is, uh, did oh, your did your personal struggle and pain with weight begin at marriage or at some other point in your life? I mean, it was always like this thing that kind of hovered around. It was like this bubble, like, this cloud o- over my head that I sometimes paid attention to, but a lot of times didn't. It was the way I dismissed the idea that um, that there's drama between mothers-in-law and, and daughters-in-law. I was like, it's not a big deal um, until it became a big deal. And so it's not that in my childhood or as a teenager I never tried. I did. I mean, I was in high school when I tried Fen Fen, and I thought my ha- I was going to have a heart attack. Um, so there were moments, but I they weren't they weren't they weren't the kind of moments that lasted too long. Um, I mostly j- I didn't hate myself is what I'm trying to say. You know, like you can say I want to work out, I want to lose some weight, and not hate yourself. But then there was a moment when I and and that's when I when I was in my first marriage that I really the self loathing began. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I have two questions. One would be very. It would really help if you go to the magazine. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, yeah, you can. Cut, yeah, yeah. You can also just cut in the front. Oh, she's so sweet. What a respectful young woman. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if it was me. I'd be like. <laughs> to the front. Two questions, Rabia. Since you're um, somewhat local. And I uh, just started reading the back of the book because I wanted to know the recipes. Is there a Pakistani grocer that you would recommend in the general area that uh, we could, you know? Don't say a word without an endorsement, but go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, across streets, cross streets. Where's my endorsement deal? Neighborhood. I'll take any. Mango juice for life endorsement deal. Um, Wait, where do you live? Um, Actually, just a block away. Oh gosh, in DC, anybody from DC know any DC? I know Virginia and I know Maryland. I assume they're, yeah, Rockville ish area has. Yeah, I mean, like, like so spring. in gr- I, in Greenbelt, I, but Caribbean Crescent Ooh. does halal meats, but I don't know if they do, they do spice. So Caribbean Crescent, okay. They're not Pakistani, but it doesn't matter. Okay, never mind. My husband, <laughs> hey, would you like to like <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Caribbean yes. Crescent in D.C. will have all the spices I talk about. This is if why you, marriages work right here. Yes. This is it. Do you want the mic? Do you want it? Wait, what, you, you see what? There's a Sudanese place in Addis Morgan. There's a Sudanese place in Addis Morgan. Will they have the Desi spices too? Because if you don't have jat masala, it's not legit. Okay. What's Do you it called? know what it's called? Khartoum. Khartoum for Khartoum. Super. Well, I get my groceries mostly from a place in Greenbelt called Anarkali Bazaar. And Anarkali to me is um, important because it's actually the name of a, a place in Lahore, my birth city, and you actually hear about it in the book. So I just go to Anarkali Bazaar. They're very well stocked. But um, that's Greenbelt. So I would say try... Ooh, but that store is hairy. Okay, listen. I'm going to tell you this. These stores... These stores might look shady, <laughs> but they're perfectly safe, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, and, and really, perfectly really safe. anything with the word bazaar yeah. will get you there. It'll get you to where you need to Indo-bank, go. Indobank, yeah. I mean, Apna, I think... Apna, bazaar, all, either of those words work. <laughs> yeah. 
We'll write these down for you afterwards. Thank you so much. I have um, uh, another S oh, second part question. of a question. So I'd, I wanted to say when you were sharing your fitness journey on Twitter with like Shanti and other things, it was really inspiring to me because I was also training to be a fitness instructor at that time. Amazing. Um, and so that was fun to have other people in the in the universe to kind of share that with. But my question is, how have you showed your children this balance of life of eating and happiness and working out and loving yourself, but also recognizing flaws? Yeah, you know what I look, I my eldest is 25. Then I have a 14 year old, then I have a five year old. So I had I was a different mother with every child. Like I had them a decade. That's three decades, people. <laughs> I had them a decade apart. I was a different mother with every child. And what I've noted, what I've realized is it didn't matter what I said or didn't say. My children's eating patterns really um, reflect on like where I was in, in that time. Like it's, they modeled their eating patterns after me. So when I had my eldest, she, I was 22. I was in law school. I didn't start eating salads till I was 30. So guess what? She doesn't eat salads, right? Like she ate the way I ate, you know? And, um, but then my 14 year old, um, I had her by the time I discovered, you know, salads and eating better. And she started going to the gym with me a couple of years ago. And she's into, she's a cross country runner right here. Uh -huh. um, oh. And, and I'm like, up. here, have a fried egg. She's like, I'll have granola, mom. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, so, you know, she has her patterns. And so, you know, we'll see how the, the younger one goes. I feel like he'll be like kind of a happy medium. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rabia. So we have about 10 more minutes. Um, if anyone has a any additional questions, that's not Alex Cronomer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Or Alex, yes. it's fine. No, no, no more for you, Alex. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking, man. I'm just joking. I'm, I haven't read the book yet, and I can't wait to read it. Um, and But my question is about um, um, like Western culture um, and how you think that, ha and, and maybe the white supremacy and colonial mindset, how that influences, or, or what observations you've had um, through your experience about how that influences um, how we think about body and body type. Yeah. So nobody let my editor watch this um, video. So uh, my editor, who is, uh, you know, she's a white lady, and she, um, again, she's not a foodie, doesn't do recipes, has never had a weight challenge. There were moments about a year ago where I was like, I am literally walking away from this book. Because uh, she couldn't understand. She's like, you're talking about these struggles and how much pain they brought you, and yet you're sharing a recipe for ghee. Or you're sharing these, r these r South Asian recipes, pakora. And I said, Delicious. I said, we don't eat a hundred of them. <laughs> we have like, I make them with whole ingredients in my house. We have two or three with a cup of tea, maybe twice a month. You know, I mean like, it, there's, and I said, and so I had to dis disabuse her of the idea that the, f the recipes I'm sharing are like unhealthy in some way. And I'm like, no, these, I have discovered after like all this time that this is actually like the food that's really nourishing and good for us. I know exactly what's going in. Ghee is good for you, you know what I mean? Um, and if it's, you know, used properly. And so I do think we have to so sometimes undo. And this is what my, so when my parents came here, they really, I remember them saying things like, um, everything in America is pure, but back home there's milavad, which means things are mixed. It's not pure. Stuff is not pure back home. Things are pure in America. And, and of course, many Americans did not know until much, much later that you've got red dye number four. Like, there's so many things in our foods that maybe they don't even qualify as food anymore. Well, and it's so genetically modified that it's adulterated from the, out of the ground. Yeah, I mean, there's a cost to being able to get produce from all over the world, season, you know, all around. Like, that's not how we were meant to eat, frankly, right? Like, so we're discovering these things much later. But in the 70s, when my parents came, it was like, you know, this is magic food. This is like, it's packaged, it's convenient, it's delicious. You can go to a window and get a whole meal. You never have to leave your car. <laughs> um, and I don't know if it, I'm sure that was a part of it was just thinking that this society is superior to ours. They know better than us. And they're not going to feed their citizens things that are not good for them. So true. And you talk about that in the book. And it goes all the way down to, to formula. Right, that formula was packaged as this like clean way, yeah. you know, the best way to not spread disease to your children yeah. from my your mom, breast milk that's adulterated. My mom told me, yeah. So you know, I was actually born in Pakistan, and so when my mother had me in the hospital, um, she was being f like the uh, formula was being foisted upon her, and the p the propaganda around formula at the time for um, for these countries was that breast milk carried disease. 
and this stuff is good for you. <sighs> yeah, and my, my dada, who is my, my father's father, my grandfather, my father's side, um, when she came home with the formula, was like, this is dead food. This is not food. And he like flung it. He said, or bring in a buffalo. We're going to give her buffalo milk. And, uh, you know, and so, and yeah. An actual buffalo. That was very actual buffalo. A real buffalo. You could do that in Pakistan. <laughs> you could just get a buffalo <laughs> off the street. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We had a lot of, um, and we really did believe the fact that we, we didn't know what we were doing. And America had it right. That's a beautiful question. We probably have uh, time for one more. All right. Oh, you can go ahead. So sorry. Thank you so much for getting up. Sorry. More of a comment and a question. Um, I know that you're both attorneys, and uh, so am I, but I've never really had the courage to go outside of my, my job description. So what has made you uh, decide to do comedy? I've watched some of your sketches, by the way, really funny. And uh, what made you, uh, aside from the activism, go out and do podcasts and, and write a book or books? You were uh, sure? Um, uh, Trump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, next question. Yeah. That was it. That was it. I just wa I, I Trump man. Um, he had this terrible interview with Anderson Cooper, and he's like, "What do you think about Islam?" He's like, "I think Islam hates us." And I'm like, "How do you be talking about Islam, bro? Like, Islam is over 1,400 years old. America's not even 300 years old. Like, but like, yeah, like, how does a civilization have a word to say about an infant, not even a walking toddler?" in the world of historicity. It was just such a devoid of any reason, um, devilish comment in my opinion that, that uh, sp spread hatred um, and, and vile vitriol against Muslim people to be basically personify a 1.8 billion person religion for a country that's not even 300 million. I don't, there's so many things I have to say about that. So I was like, I need to be in front of people. Yeah. I got just gonna go up. I'm just gonna do an open mic. You guys have it. to check out Yasmin's comedy. Thank you. I love yes. you, Robbie. Don't, please don't. Don't say any no. more. Please no. stop. There's a reason I asked. <laughs> Do you want to keep? Do you want to give him the There's website? There's a re re yeah. Let's. So Yasmin, tell me about your, like, your upcoming uh, gigs uh, right, that right, you've right. got going uh, on. I'm, I'm just, like, I just want you to know I'm at GW Jack Morton Auditorium on November 12th. I am also at DC Improv on December 1st. Write this down right now. Yeah. Are you yeah. Gonna, are, You know it's all uh, yasminalhadi.com. Thank you. <laughs> just put my name into Google. Thank you. Yes, Google. Okay. Google her and follow her. What made you uh, draw outside the lines, the lawyerly lines? No, look. Um, when serial happened, I had already shifted from immigration and civil rights practice to national security policy because I was trying to understand what was fueling law enforcement uh, going into our communities and basically surveying them. I just wanted to know, and then we realized, oh, all this really terrible training is happening, and so I started working in policy, and then. When Serial ended, what I realized was, I mean, it didn't produce the result that I needed, which is like, is there some incredible evidence that's going to get Adnan out? All it did was say, eh, maybe he did, maybe he didn't after, after the end of those episodes. And that wasn't helpful. It didn't help the reason I, you know, the whole mission behind me contacting Sarah Koenig. So I had been write, blogging furiously during Serial. And when it ended, um, and Shahid's not here tonight, but a dear friend, Shahid Manala, was like, Rabe, you have to start a podcast because you have so much more to say and there's so much evidence that they didn't cover and people want to hear this in their ears. And I'm like, I'm not going to do a podcast. And four months later, me and two other lawyers started Undisclosed and we did the podcast. And we were, the plan was we're just going to cover Adnan's case, fill in all the gaps or, or make the corrections the serial uh, failed to do. But as we were doing it, we started getting a request from Innocence Projects. And parents who are like my son's incarcerated my brother's incarcerated my like like and these like and y it's really hard to say no um and when an innocence project comes to you those are the experts man and they're coming to you to say can you look at this case we have hit a wall we've had it for eight years 10 years 15 years um then you can't it's hard to say no if so you're a good person <laughs> if you're a good person okay. and all three of us had full-time jobs i just quit my job when i had the baby so the three of us kept our full-time jobs started working on these cases independently kept undisclosed co uh, going for seven years and um, and in seven years, we helped bring home 13 defendants. Incredible. Which, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm very proud of. That's just, that's more than yeah. one per year. But the thing about, <laughs> but the, thi the thing about podcasting the is, on that. it gets really addictive to be able to like make a living in your, from your basement in your PJs. <laughs> Nobody has to see you. And also. I'm so happy we're seeing you now. I know. And, 
but also people were like, we just love your voice. Just narrate stuff for us. Just your talk. voice is amazing. So you talk about she in the book. She talks about how it's like a kind of a manly voice, and I was like, do you mean Scarlett Johansson voice? What do you mean? Yeah. Do you mean a sexy voice? Um, do an audio book. I've I've she done two. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't think you're a super fan, and you need to be. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sit I down, narrated. Sit down. A, yeah, I narrated a non-story, <laughs> and that got uh, that got an award for audio Amazing. narration. Come I, on, I did. Come on, give her a round of applause for her voice. <laughs> she did nothing to earn it. Nothing. I just leaned into it, and um, and I narrated Fatty Fatty Boom Boom. And it is so yeah. so good. And you will have an opportunity to buy a copy of Fatty Fatty Boom Boom today and have it signed. You can't leave until by you buy one. Incredible, Rabia Choudhury. Let's give it Thank up for guys. her. Thank you for this incredible opportunity and thank you to Politics and Pros.